section twelve of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the man who understood women and other stories by leonard merrick the prince in the fairy tale the carriage is at the door madam how strange that still sounds when the solemn butler says it to me rosy macleod i go wrapped in furs down the great staircase past the two footmen whose pomposity if i may own the truth rather frightens me and enter my carriage in a dream for a few minutes my grandeur seems unreal i am remembering winters when i used to shiver in a spring jacket and to pan my summer straw i feel as cinderella must have felt on her way to the ball and indeed i hold my history no less fairy-like than hers and my hero no less charming than her prince i want to write the tale and to think that far away in dear old england other girls will read it i ought to explain that i am writing in new york a city that i never expected to see in all my life but let me begin at the beginning the beginning then was a draughty flat in west kensington in looking back at it i see always a delicate sweet-faced woman sitting by the fire and a dark slip of a girl sketching at a table covered by a faded green cloth the woman was my mother the girl was i i know now that i had very little talent but i meant to be an artist when i sold my copy of shoeing the bay mare one morning while i was working at the national i was prouder of myself than i have ever been since pray don't think i am vain of it now copies of that were rather easy to sell and the girls in my time were accordingly eager for their turn to begin it i only mention the matter because it was the first and the last money that my mother saw me earn dear little mother but we were very happy together weren't we although we were poor dear little mother if you were living to-day what lovely lovely things you should have at her death i was left quite alone it is true that i had some second cousins but i had not met them and they showed no desire to meet me then from one source and another i had about three hundred pounds and in my ignorance i expected to support myself by my brush before the sum had melted when i was free of the flat i took a lodging in bayswater and continued to study at a life class excepting that i worked and hoped and very often cried there is nothing to tell you of the next two years then one afternoon i saw miss niblett in kensington gardens she was an artist who had long been an acquaintance of ours as far back as i remember she used to drop in to tea about twice a year and talk of the great things she was going to do she never seemed to grow any older nor to do the great things she was a spirited chirpy little woman and when she settled in paris both my mother and i had missed her occasional visits very much in the broad walk she greeted me as brightly as ever and we strolled to the round pond and talked for an hour she was returning in a week's time and i heard that she was living there in the cheapest possible way occupying a studio and bedroom in the quarter called montparnasse and marketing and cooking for herself she told me of the great things she was going to do why don't you come back with me child she asked presently come and study in paris and then you won't be so lonely wouldn't you like to i should love it i faltered with a heart thump but but what 
i don't know for one thing i can't speak french tut cried miss niblett hundreds of the girls don't speak french you'll learn for a minute we sat silent gazing at the toy ships sailing across the pond then she added briskly you had better come all right i said and that was how i went yes i went to study in paris and to live in the queerest fashion imaginable our rooms were up ninety-eight stairs of a dingy house in a dilapidated court at six o'clock in the morning the court used to wake and be so exceedingly busy and cheerful withal that any one there would have been ashamed to lie abed to begin with there was the rushing of water outside for tap there was none and one by one the tenants clattered to a pump with a bucket to obtain their supply for the day then the hawkers made their appearance each with his own peculiar chant it arrives it arrives the mackerel who wishes for my fine mackerel this morning and the mussels the mussels most delicious and some milk some fresh milk and i mustn't forget the noise that was made by shaking out the rugs from every window i have never seen a city that opens its eyes so good-humouredly as paris in pictures it is always shown to us at night with its myriad lamps shining or in the afternoon when it is frivolous and its fountains flash but in my own little unimportant opinion if one would know paris at its sweetest and its best one should get up very very early and behold it smiling when it wakes to work i've told you that we lived up ninety-eight stairs i must tell you something about the people who lived on the lower landings of course the lower the landing the higher the rent but none of our neighbours had an air of opulence need i say it all of them bustled to the pump with pails all of them cooked their own meals and it was rather a rare occurrence i believe for everybody in that house to cook a dinner on the same day on the floor below ours there was a madame troquet who painted fans and chocolate boxes for a livelihood the expensive and gorgeous boxes covered with satin which fortunate people have sent to them at christmas and on their birthdays still lower there was an american youth who was studying medicine i am afraid he did not study it very hard i should be sorry to think that if i were ill in america one day he might be called in to prescribe for me lower still there were two young frenchmen one of them wrote verses and his companion made sketches for some of the papers and there was another american who had moved in while miss niblett was in london so good-looking he was about seven and twenty and oh he was shabby it made my heart ache to see the threadbare clothes he wore even there where i had come to take threadbare clothes for granted i used to meet him at the pump sometimes and then he always insisted on carrying my pail for me i felt horrid to let him do it i guessed he didn't have enough to eat and needed all his strength to drag his own pail up the stairs not that he showed any signs of weakness he would mount beside me as gaily as if he liked the work and the bucket were no more than a featherweight he seemed quite strong and happy and i have told you how nice looking he was haven't i a girl cannot allow a young man to carry a pail of water up ninety-eight stairs for her without thanking him i mean it was impossible for me just to say thank you as if he had handed me the toast or picked up my sunshade of course we spoke as we went up the stairs he told me he was an art student like me and i thought that no poor young man had ever been more courageous and contented with his lot if one call a little a lot he talked as if he loved the life to listen to him one would have imagined that poverty bohemianism he termed it was a kind of treat a privilege for the select like a ticket for the royal enclosure 
i used to forget to pity him till i looked at his coat i think you are very brave i couldn't help saying once brave he exclaimed why how's that where's the hardship i think it's just the right thing for a man to carry home his bread for breakfast and dine for a franc when he's flush it's glorious teaches him to be independent and you he went on in a different tone is it very hard for you oh i am one of the wealthy for the time being i laughed i have quite a fortune as yet what shall you do when you have squandered your millions people did not stand on ceremony with one another at our pump paint i said nobody to help you he asked my own right hand said i he regarded it ruefully the prospect is not so charming as the hand he murmured is it it's glorious i declaimed for a girl to carry home her bread for breakfast and dine for a franc when she's flush no it isn't he said for a girl it's a different thing altogether you'll excuse my contradicting you besides even a franc wants earning when you have no allowance from home i shall sell my work i declared valiantly in those days i always spelt my work with a capital w i guess pictures take a deal of selling sometimes i suppose you mean that you don't think i shall ever paint well i haven't seen anything you have done he answered how could i mean that here we are at the top we had reached our door and miss niblett was standing there a stiff little figure of disapproval considering that i was only showing the young man simple civility in return for his extreme kindness i am bound to say that miss niblett's later remarks were absurd miss niblett said she should go downstairs with the pail herself in future when she came up the next morning i was all ears was she alone no i could hear her speaking and then there were steps as someone turned away that mr martin is certainly polite she said as she entered he insisted on bringing it up for me who did i inquired loftily that mr martin she repeated who else do you suppose would take the trouble oh i didn't know his name was martin i explained you seem to be on very friendly terms with him tut said miss niblett don't be ridiculous child and make haste with the coffee do though i did not meet mr martin at the pump any more i very often chanced to meet him on my way home from the art school each time i liked him better and of course i knew i wasn't doing all the liking myself he never said anything but a girl can always tell can't she when i heard of the shifts that some of the young men in the house were put to for a meal and thought that his straits must be as cruel as any of them i could have cried there were moments when food almost choked me as i pictured him sitting half starved in his room his chin sunk on his breast i never saw him with his chin sunk on his breast never despondent in any way but i was sure his buoyancy was just put on to hide his sufferings when i had been living in the court for about two months the sight of his coat and the idea of his privations proved too bad to be borne we had become such comrades by then for the walk from the school took a long time especially if one didn't walk very fast that i thought he would let me speak like a sister to him mr martin i murmured one day as we went home i want you to do me a great favour please why certainly he said right now what is it well i said 
we are both students and we are very good friends and it's all nonsense for you to reply that because i'm a girl you can't regard me as a real chum and when i had stammered that i turned red and gazed at the tips of my shoes but i haven't replied anything of the sort he said with a laugh i'm waiting to hear what you want me to do you won't be offended i asked i'm sure i could never be offended with you he said earnestly or hurt i added i'm sure you would never hurt me well then i want you to let me lend you a little money till things are better will you his eyes widened at me and then he blushed he did he blushed i saw the colour spread right up to his temples i hated myself though i had done my best to say it all delicately i am very very grateful to you said mr martin believe me i'm not in need of money but you're a chum indeed oh you're too proud to confess i gulped and there was a lump in my throat that i couldn't swallow we were crossing one of the bridges and i stopped and looked at the sun sinking while i tried to blink my tears back he stood there by me and was quiet for a minute when he spoke i hardly recognized his voice it trembled so much will you tell me something he whispered i nodded why did you say this to me because i know you are poor and i'm poor and can understand but i could spare a small sum easily and i thought you'd be great enough to let me help you you have helped me he answered helped me to ask you a question that i hadn't the pluck to put dear little chum do you care for me yes i told him enough to wait till a pauper can afford to marry you yes i told him i love you said mr martin with all my heart and the boats were sailing down the river and a crowd was on the bridge but i couldn't see them in all paris there was no one but ourselves we were alone in the sunset he and i i knew what miss niblett would say and she said it tut she warned me that i was doing a rash an improvident thing and after she had reproached herself for bringing me to france and prophesied a hopeless waiting and the workhorse for me by turns she hugged me splendidly and wished me happiness there you have miss niblett then my fiance was invited up to supper and we were merry i was annoyed to see that while i was making the salad she had examined him about his prospects of course i did see it when i came back by his embarrassed look and miss niblett's air of dissatisfaction still i repeat that we were merry that evening although i could not help regretting that i had so often spoken to her of my fear that he didn't get enough to eat it wasn't quite nice while we sat at supper to think she was reflecting that a substantial meal was by way of being a novelty to my lover it hurt me that good little miss niblett though she had let me prepare the supper so that she might have a chance to pester him with questions she made amends by clearing the things away herself and shut the door behind her that was the first time he kissed me after all that has happened since the scene remains clear and living to me the little lamp-lit room half studio half parlour the scent of the mignonette in the open window and the promised land i saw beyond when i'm old and grey it will be living to me still his voice his touch and the joy that was singing in my heart and by and by we all went out i have pennies to spend pleaded my lover let's be lavish could i be wise on such a night 
away we sped from montparnasse into the paris where the cabs darted and the cafes glittered and we had syrups and fizzy waters under the trees in the starlight and made believe that we were rich i thought miss niblett must have been in love herself once upon a time she was so tactful it was a long ramble that we took like children we joked outside a jeweller's window pretending to choose the costliest of engagement rings like vagrants we loitered by a great house where a reception was being held yes we stood there on the pavement and watched the grand people arriving and for the first time for hours i remembered we were poor why aren't we going to a party how lovely it would be are you keen on parties my lover asked perhaps i could take you to one this week shall i try a party like that i laughed yes please ah well he replied i can't guarantee that it will be quite like that still i guess it will be rather fun will miss niblett go too i she exclaimed don't talk nonsense i wonder he said which is the best place in this city to hire a suit of dress clothes for the evening my social gaieties have given me no cause to find out that was all we turned homeward i thought with miss niblett that he had been talking nonsense imagine how surprised i was to hear him revive the subject after a day or two well it's all right he said i've managed it we're invited invited i echoed invited where why to the festivity tomorrow night but i cried you didn't really mean it did you you didn't suppose i'd go the people are strangers to me oh that's nothing he answered in society they often go to strangers parties it's rather chic well we aren't in society i reminded him i'm not chic i can't go junketing with a lot of students i've never seen before you'll be a bohemian rosie he said you don't seem to catch on to the tone of the quarter at all now do come if you're a good girl you shall be rewarded you see i have my clothes ready and it would disappoint me some not to get a chance to show em off he made such a point of it that i promised but i wasn't pleased besides being reluctant to intrude i was annoyed at the thought of having put him to expense also the idea of his going to a party in a hired suit was distasteful to me i went to my school as cross as two sticks early the next morning he ran upstairs in a great hurry to borrow our newspaper i wondered why he wanted it for he always read la matine and we took the new york harem however we were busy and let him have it though we hadn't looked at it ourselves yet we were busy examining the white silk frock that i meant to wear i was for freshening it with some new tulle, and miss niblett kept saying that it would be folly to spend the money the argument lasted such a long time that i didn't go to school at all that day miss niblett won and then behold an afternoon of amazement as i was boiling the kettle there came a rap at the door and whom should i admit but a stylish young woman with a note and a large box the note consisted of four words frills for the fairest and the box contained a dress but my dears a dress that i can't describe to you i should need a page to do it justice such a dress as the fairy godmother might have created when she changed a pumpkin to a chariot what does it mean i gasped is that from him stammered miss niblett oh don't you know it's from him i cried hotly now i see why you wouldn't let me buy the tool but how can he have paid for it and how could you encourage him i thought she was going to cry 
rosie she whimpered he told me he wanted to give you a dress and asked me to help him but i never imagined he meant a dress like that i didn't indeed how could i oh my child look at the name on the lid look where it comes from mademoiselle will try it on suggested the young woman coolly what does she say i demanded she spoke french of course it is to be hoped she didn't understand english she says you had better try it on this is madness i faltered i looked from the young woman to miss niblett i looked from miss niblett back to the frock madness i repeated and tried it on oh what a frock there were exclamations and pins and stitches and in the middle of it all came another bang at the door a porter in uniform stood on the landing he too bore a note and a box he too behaved as if miracles happened every day in the year four words again swayed for the sweetest gloves if you please a stack of them with i can't tell you how many buttons and the faintest odour of violets i know now that in the whole of paris there is only one shop that sells gloves quite like those and that they are famous all over the world a knock at the door by this time we opened it speechlessly we just glanced at each other and tottered and again four words bonds for the best i tore off the brown paper with hands that shook under the brown paper tissue paper under the tissue paper the glint of velvet pale blue i drew out a jewel case i pressed a spring and oh gracious screamed miss niblett shimmering on the satin with which the case was lined lay a rope of pearls fit for an empress not even a string a rope three times round the neck it would wind and hang almost to the waist we fell on to the sofa dazed are they real miss niblett panted oh my dear give me the case my dear they are real i'm sure they are oh my dear they must be worth thousands upon thousands of pounds what does it all mean and for the rest of the day not a glimpse of my fiance not a message from him monsieur martin was out the concierge told us when we inquired it had been arranged that he should come for me at ten o'clock and at half past eight i began to dress we lit every candle in the flat that evening at five minutes to ten i was ready all but one glove we sat trembling with curiosity then we heard him singing on the stairs and he tapped as the hour struck now we both cried perhaps you'll explain if his clothes weren't his own he had discovered a remarkable establishment i noted that despite my dizziness i fancy i have mentioned how nice-looking he was but i had never really done him justice before he was worthy to take his frock out he stood there admiringly presenting a bouquet explain he murmured oh you mean those things i sent you my dear ladies patience is one of the most beautiful of virtues let us cultivate it rosie you're a dream of loveliness i thought perhaps you'd like a few flowers shall we go and we went i had expected to see a cab at the corner there was a brougham with a footman waiting on the curb not mine said the man of mystery i assure you hired like your clothes i flashed much more so he said serenely would you prefer the window up or down dear either i said if you'll tell me where we're going why to the party he replied i thought you knew 
you don't ask me to believe we're going to a student's supper dressed like this well no he said i guess we'd be a trifle overpowering eh but i never told you it was a student's supper that student was an invention of your own we rolled along luxuriously to my bewilderment it seemed that all the capital was astir that night crowds crowds everywhere in the brilliant streets paris was a panorama of lights and faces after a while we began to move more slowly other vehicles impeded us i could hear the jangling of horses bits the orders of the police we're drawing close said my lover the clatter of hoofs was to right and left of us now from the window i saw the glare of carriage lamps caught glimpses of great ladies gowns and jewelled heads the brougham swung through gates into a courtyard we are there said my lover i stood on the steps of a palace on either side of me soldiers were drawn up startling spectacular music swelled through the doorway flunkies bowed at our approach where have you brought me i whispered whose house is this he's called the president of the french republic was the answer don't be shy we passed through the dazzle of the hall the lights blinded me and the scent of the roses was very strong i heard great names spoken names that made me catch my breath as those awe-inspiring names were uttered the scene became more and more unreal and the guests the guests who bore the historical names looked quite ordinary prick me and i shall bleed persons i think that was the most vivid impression i had in the elysee the difference between the persons and their names soon through the throng among the regal toilettes of the women and the groups of distinguished decorated men i grew conscious of the figure of an elderly gentleman with iron-gray hair and a rather sad smile moving near to us i recognized him by the photographs that i had seen and i knew it was the president himself now said the voice at my side i'm going to present you to him try to look as if you liked it for an instant i saw the other end of the glittering salon turning very very small and dim and i thought i was going to faint i hadn't the slightest notion whether i ought to put out my hand to him or kiss his hand or sweep a curtsy and if you want to know which of the three i did i am unable to tell you but my lover affirmed afterwards that i was real charming and you may take his word for it if you are kind enough i can't pretend that it convinces me for i never felt such a gawk in all my days i don't know how long we stayed at the elysee i have a vague recollection of eating an ice but the next thing i remember clearly is our entering the brougham again and driving away into the fresh sweet air then i leant towards him i said if you've any consideration for me you'll answer right off and tell me whether i'm awake or asleep i have pinched myself three times and i'm still not sure you darling he laughed i was afraid you'd read it all before i confessed that was why i stole your newspaper so you did i exclaimed why are you in the paper well you see my rosy posy i bought those pearls for you yesterday he said and i had to get the bank to identify me i suppose the jewellers chattered last night he took the paper from his overcoat and there if you can believe me by the light of the little electric lamp over our heads this is what i saw an american millionaire's son in montparnasse mr martin macleod plays at poverty the extraordinary experiment of a young croesus after that what remains for me to tell you what his father said 
well his father didn't object to me a bit and always declares that martin's marriage was the most sensible action of his life though that's nonsense we spend six months of the year in america and the other six in europe miss niblett is still in paris i am afraid she will never do the great things but she will never be hard up any more for my prince is as generous as he is rich the story i have tried to write is finished isn't it as marvellous as any fairy tale but it is true and i wonder if any other woman has ever been so blessed as i and thank god for my great happiness the carriage is at the door madam oh is it indeed well i am not going out just yet for there is a little girl running across the room to say that mother has been writing long enough and must come and play and there's marty marty with his arm round me looking down in my face end of section twelve Section 13 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick With Intent to Defraud He wished he were dead. It was not a phrase, a verbal extravagance. He wished it. The only time that he was free from anxiety was when he was asleep. His days were full of hard work and disappointments and efforts to make civil words do the duty of money. And it often occurred to George Collier, when he lay his head on the pillow, that if no tomorrow morning came to disturb him, it would be a blessed state of things. He was a writer of humorous books. When he married Eva, he had been nine and twenty, and sanguine, though his humour did not command big prices so far. The critics were very kind to him, and Eva was very admiring, and he went on writing patiently. But by degrees he saw that his confidence had been premature, and then he saw that his marriage had been premature. And then a child was born, and he gave up his ideals and sank to pot-boiling, and the pot-boiling did not make the pot boil very violently either. A baby added to his embarrassments a good deal. The long clothes seemed no sooner bought than it needed short clothes, and before he had recovered from the cost of these, it had grown out of them. The nurse appeared to lie awake all night, thinking what she could ask for next, and she was a superior person with imagination. Today there were school fees to be paid, and Eva was no longer admiring, and their address was Pandora Road, Palham. The little house to the right was called Broadlands, and the one to the left was called The Towers, and Collier, in a fit of moroseness, had labelled their own house The Hut, and made enemies among the neighbours. Yes, Eva's sympathy had worn out, like the cheap drawing-room carpet. Balham and Tooting had got on her nerves, perhaps, or George, the failure, was a different man from the popular humorist with whom she had pictured herself driving to brilliant receptions in fashionable gowns. Anyhow, when he reflected that there had been a time when secretly he wrote poetry about her, he turned hot. She was a pale, slight woman with grey eyes and fluffy hair, and a red flannel dressing gown in the morning. After luncheon, when she made her toilet, the grey eyes acquired a soulfulness that came out of a file and nobody would have suspected the tart and vulgar reproaches that could fall from her lips. Had she been what she looked, he thought sometimes, contemplating her wonderingly when an acquaintance was present, his courage wouldn't have deserted him so soon. But if he had confessed that she weighed on him, the acquaintance would have considered him an unappreciative brute. She looked too wistful and delicate and fragile to weigh on anyone. He was forty years of age, and soberly and deliberately he wished he were dead. Only one thing deterred him from making away with himself in a painless fashion. It was the knowledge that he would leave her and Chick unprovided for. This was his frame of mind when he came to project a fraud. 
he saw his way to dying comfortably while safeguarding Chick and Eva from want. That is to say, he saw his way if he could raise the money necessary to pay the premium. He proposed to assure his life and commit suicide. The curious part of it was that he had always been a very scrupulous man, as honest as the day, that day that nobody remembers. He had never wronged anyone by so much as expense, and would have confronted a cross-examination without a tremor. People had often said that he was too conscientious to get on, yet now he was meditating robbery on an extensive scale and barely perceiving his defection. A man whom he knew very well, and who frequently dropped in of an evening, was Mr. Horace Orkney, a solicitor. George was not sensible of any strong esteem for him, but, perhaps for that reason, Orkney looked the likeliest person for what he wanted. And one afternoon he betook himself to the gentleman's office. I have, he said, when greetings had been exchanged, come on rather delicate business. I needn't tell you that what I am going to say is in confidence. Quite so, said Orkney, playing with the ends of his moustache. The fact is, things aren't going well. I'm deadly tired of it all, and, well, the truth is, I'm anxious to make away with myself. The lawyer was only thirty-six, and he started. To make away with yourself? Oh, nonsense. I mean what I say, insisted Collier. Don't imagine I'm talking through my hat. I haven't come here to waste your time, but my life isn't assured. You see the difficulty? I've got to think of my wife and child, and they'll be practically penniless. Assure it, suggested Mr. Orkney, with a shrug. I should certainly assure my life, in any case, if I were you. But, my dear Collier, do let me dissuade you from such a... Uh, such a... upon my word. He pulled out his monogrammed handkerchief, diffusing an agreeable odour of white rose. You upset me very much. I won't trouble you with my arguments. I haven't come to make a sensation and be talked round and that kind of thing. My mind is made up, and I know my own mind better than anybody can tell it to me. You say assure. The point is, I can't assure, because I can't put my hands on the money. Oh, said Orkney, what did you think of assuring for? While I'm about it, I want to make a proper provision. I want to arrange for an income of, uh, say, four or five hundred. For them to get as much as that... From a safe investment, the premium would be pretty stiff. A year's premium would come to, well, I reckon it's three hundred and twenty pounds. Now, my idea was... Was what? asked the solicitor, blandly. George was nervous. His gaze wandered. My idea was that you might be willing to advance the sum with a view to doing me a turn and making a bit at my death. I... I'm eager to make the proposal as attractive as I can. If you'll let me have three hundred and twenty, I'll fix up my will at once and leave you a thousand. What do you say? I think it's fair. Horace Orkney tapped his fingers together pensively. One likes to do a pal a turn, of course, but... What company are you thinking of, anyhow? You seem to overlook the fact that in a case of suspected suicide... I've overlooked nothing. I've thought it all out, and I know exactly what I shall do. A cousin of my wife's has a cottage in Kent, on the Darenth. We've often stayed there. The lawn slopes to the river, and there's an Indian canoe. No more solitary place could exist. Now, I can easily contrive so that we get an invitation to go down for a week. One evening, after working hard all day, I shall say that I'm going out for a breath of fresh air. I shall ask what time they're going to have supper, and set my watch by their clock, so that I mayn't be late. I shall ask my wife to remind me of something I have to do in the morning, and skip through the window in the happiest spirits. Well, the canoe upsets. Everybody knows I could never learn to swim. But your intentions may change, my friend. And if they do, where are my three hundred and twenty pounds? In the natural course of things, you may live for thirty or forty years. I thought, said Collier, of waiting till the spring, but if you don't think it would look suspicious, the accident can occur next month. There's not much risk of my intentions changing in a month. There was silence. I'll turn it over in my mind, said Orkney, at last. Now you must let me send you away. I'm busy. Having turned it over in his mind, he agreed. He
he provided George Collier with a sum of three hundred and twenty pounds to take out a policy, and George made a will by which Horace Orkney was bequeathed one thousand. The rest was left to Eva, who, to give her her due, was an affectionate mother. The humorist was now comparatively content. It was already November, and he was to die in April. He had had hopes that Orkney would pronounce it safe for him to take the step earlier, but on reflection Orkney had said that the spring would be best, after all. It was a disappointment, but George was too grateful to complain of a crumpled rose leaf. He had borne the slings and arrows so hopelessly that he told himself he would be a rotter to kick at five more monks. He was not unreasonable. And as the weeks wore away, his satisfaction increased. He was a weary man looking forward to a perpetual holiday. There was a serious epidemic of influenza in London that year. Everybody who could afford to do so was flying to the watering places of the continent and among those who remained in town and were laid low was Mrs. Collier. This was at Christmas. The doctor did not, at the beginning, regard her case gravely, but she got worse in spite of his optimism, and after a fortnight in bed, she died. George was inexpressibly shocked. Though he had long since outlived his illusions about her, she had been his wife, his daily companion. To realize that she was gone dismayed him. He remembered the girl and shed tears at the grave of the woman, not analyzing, not drawing the distinction, but just grieving honestly. After she was buried, as he sat in the quiet parlor, smoking at night, it occurred to him that, as the child would now be doubly an orphan, he must arrange where she was to live when April came. In the circumstances, she would be an heiress, and he wanted her to be suitably brought up. Fortunately, he had a maiden sister who could be depended on to carry out his wishes in this respect. He nodded thankfully, reflecting how much troubled he would have been for Chick's future otherwise. And January came to an end, and February began, and February waned, and it was March. George was surprised to note how rapidly time had passed since the funeral. He put March 1st at the top of a letter very slowly, and sat looking at it with startled eyes. A month more, and the consummation would be reached. Poor little chick, he would have to leave her. Oddly, now that the end of it all was so near, he felt less eager than he had done. He had been conscious of late, of a certain enjoyment in life, a new enjoyment. The quiet parlour with his pipe and a novel had been pleasant. He had gone up to his room at night without a groan, and seated himself at his desk in the morning with an unfamiliar zest. Only a month, well... Let him make the most of it. But that was easier to say than to do. Death no longer figured in his thoughts as a perpetual holiday. Now that he was a widower, it figured as a skeleton, and thrust itself into the cosiest stars. Perhaps Chick was on his knee, and he was stroking her hair, and the skeleton clanked. Perhaps he was writing in the small hours, interested in his work, and the skeleton mocked him. What was the good of Chick's love when he had to leave her directly? What was the good of revising a chapter when he would be bones before the book was done? He shuddered. It was no use blinking the truth. The fact was, the conditions had altered. He would have been a cheerful man today, for all his pecuniary worries, if he had been allowed. And the worries themselves looked less formidable somehow. Eva had made the worst of everything, and, heaven forgive him, had always been a muddler. It was amazing what a difference her removal made. He was satisfied with life now, and he knew he did not want to die. At last he determined to go to Orkney and beg to be released. It was an odious task, but the alternative was more obnoxious still, and he went. Orkney looked at him in blank disapproval when he had stammered to a conclusion. "'This is very unbusinesslike,' he said. "'Very unbusinesslike indeed. You put me in a most awkward position, Collier.' I don't want to see you die, of course. I, I hope I have a heart. But an agreement is an agreement, and I have pressing need for a thousand pounds. As it happens, I've got a bill. You see, said George, helplessly, there's a child. I don't like to leave her alone in the world. I thought you told me at the time of your wife's death that she could go to an aunt in Dorking. Yes, I did, but, well, I'm very fond of her. The parting is devilish hard. 
I don't see why it should be any harder this morning than when you came here and made your proposal. I did a friendly thing for you, and I must say this isn't at all fair treatment. It wasn't an agreement that I could enforce, you know. I relied on your honour. And now you put me off with empty excuses? Don't say that, faltered George. To tell you the honest truth, I don't know how it is. Since I lost my wife, I... I'm not so depressed. I feel lighter, and there's a different aspect to things. I can't explain it. No, said Orkney firmly. I won't hear it. I won't have the blame laid at the door of that poor little woman. This is cowardly, Collier. Be a man and say that you've changed your mind and are trying to back out. Very well, then, replied George. I've changed my mind. I want to live and to pay you the thousand pounds as soon as I can get it together. The solicitor smiled finely. It was a very fair rate of interest for the time agreed upon. But for a period of years, anyhow, we needn't discuss the point. So far as I understand your position, there would be very little prospect of your repaying even the principal. In other words, you won't consent? I regret, said Orkney, I regret very much that you should have put such a suggestion forward, because I am unable to consent to it, and it's a peculiarly painful one to refuse. I don't think it was delicate of you, Collier. It was in good taste. Good taste, be damned, said George hotly. Finally you insist on your pound of flesh? Finally, returned Orkney, rising, I repeat that if you are a man of honour, there is only one thing for you to do. He touched the bell, and George slunk out into the street. It was April already. He had either to break his undertaking, or to fulfil it without delay. Instinctively, he saw the literary value of the situation. But the humorist felt no desire to treat it humorously. He found himself, on the contrary, perpending it as an experiment in realism. To the devil with literature. He must die, or tell Orkney that he was going to sell him. Which should it be? One cause was ghastly, and the other was disgraceful. He vacillated Ali for a fortnight, and Orkney, meanwhile, seemed ubiquitous. George could not take a walk without meeting him, and Orkney always stopped and spoke, and asked him very coldly how he was. George used to struggle for composure, but not with success. Then the solicitor would elevate his eyebrows and sigh significantly, and Collier went his way, feeling despicable and ashamed. The pound of flesh, to be or not to be, what a lot of titles suggested themselves for the story that might be written. The thought of it obsessed him, and one evening he actually began it. The impulse was foolish, but the occupation was fascinating, and he wrote with unaccustomed ease. He treated the subject in a serious narrative. At one o'clock he came to a point where he had to determine what the end was going to be. How was it to end? He rose and paced the room, refilling his pipe. He could not light it. It was blocked. He wasted five minutes in it, fuming. If he didn't smoke, he couldn't think. Formerly, he had annexed his wife's happens in such emergencies, and, as a last resource, it occurred to him that if he searched in the wardrobe where her belongings had been put away, he might find some happens. The key was on his own keychain, and he went upstairs. The dead woman's trifles had been laid on the shelves. He saw her work basket and her dressing case, and a set of brushes with E on the backs in silver that he had given her on her last birthday. There was a hat that she had been trimming when she was taken ill, with the needle still sticking on it. He paused. Momentarily, what he was doing seemed sacrilege. Then he opened the dressing case and lifted the tray. There were hairpins scattered at the bottom. There was also a bundle of letters, tied with ribbon, and directed in a handwriting that looked familiar. George stared at it. Was he making a mistake? Or what on earth had the correspondence been about? He turned white and pulled the ribbon off. The dates that the letters bore were of the last two years. There was nothing criminal in them, but they were a man's confidential communication to a woman he loved. They spoke of the writer's sympathy, of his regret that he could do nothing to alleviate the dreariness of a life. There were frequent allusions to what might have been, and they began, Dearest Mrs. Collier, and were signed, Yours with devotion, Horace Orkney. George stumbled out of the bedroom and returned to the parlour. He sank into his chair there, 
with knitted brows, pondering. After a while he picked up his pen again, but he did not continue the story. He wrote, Dear Sir, I restore to you here with certain letters of yours, for which I have no use. I perceive that the late Mrs. Collier's untimely decease frustrated your hope of marrying a widow whose natural attractions would have been enhanced by the possession of nine thousand pounds, and I tender you my condolence. The bequest, in my will, will stand, but as you once pointed out, I may, in the ordinary course of things, live for forty years longer. Believe me, I have every intention of doing so if I can. And he did, and became a very successful man. End of section 13 Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Section 14 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick Dead Violets If you ever want me, write to me. I'd come to you from the end of the world, he had said. And she had answered, I shall always want you, but I shall never write, and you must never come. She was married. It was in May that they parted. They parted on the day of her owning that she cared for him. The virtue was hers, not his. Yet, because he loved her, and realized that she was too good a woman to defy her conscience and be happy, he acquiesced in her decision, refrained from pleading to her, refrained from trying to see her again. His only indulgence was to send violets to her home in Paris for the ninth of December. The ninth of December was her birthday, and violets, she had once told him, were her favorite flower. He did not scribble any greeting with them, did not even enclose a card. He was sure that she would know who sent them, and it lightened his pain to feel that she would know. Indeed, to recall himself to her thus mutely was a joy the only joy that he had experienced since the day of the good-bye. Almost it was as if he were going to her, that moment in the London florists when he held the flowers that would reach her hands. She did not seem so lost to him for the moment. The separation did not seem so blank. The next year, also, he sent violets for the ninth of December. His emotions, it is true, were less vivid this time, but he was glad to show her that he was faithful. Besides, the prettiness of the reminder pleased him. And the third year? He sent them chiefly because he felt that she would be disappointed if he appeared to forget. So it had grown to be his custom to send violets to her for her birthday, though what was once an impulse of devotion was now a lie, the weakness of a sentimentalist reluctant to wound a woman and his self-esteem, by admitting that he had exaggerated the importance of his feelings. And each December the woman had welcomed the lie with smiles and tears, and believed that he loved her still. When five years had passed, he met her again. It was in Bond Street, and he had sent the violets to Paris two or three days before. Phil! As he turned and saw her, he thought, how much better-looking she used to be. She was young still, no more than thirty, but she had longed for him on every day of the five years, and her tears had blotted some of the girlishness from her face. As he turned and saw her, the woman thought how his mouth had twitched when he said, I'd come to you from the end of the world. It is among the unacknowledged truths that sentimentality may create as much ferment as enduring love, and he had suffered even more violently than she, though he had not suffered so long. "'What are you doing here in December? You're the last person I should have expected to see,' she said. "'I go south tomorrow.' "'Lucky man! And you?' "'We're living here now.' "'Really? You've left Paris? How long?' "'We've been here since October. We're flat-hunting.' "'Oh!' 
they stood looking into each other's eyes neither knowing what to say next her heart was thumping terribly and she felt very happy and very frightened more than once she had been tempted to write to him that her courage had broken down all resistance seemed to have left her as she stood looking into his eyes again flats she added in a voice of composure are so abominably dear in london where are you staying in apartments bayswater bayswater must be a change from Neuilly. it was a jolly little place you had in Neuilly. it was rather jolly wasn't it my my husband's people wished us to come over they thought they might put him into something over here of course in paris it was cheap but there were no prospects i understand there's some talk of a secretaryship if a company is floated it was so natural to be telling him everything now that they had met it would be a very good thing for us i hope it'll come off yes well how are you i'm always seeing your name one of the novels of the year they aren't so good as the novels that nobody read not quite why i'm turning out what's wanted now one has to live yes still isn't it a pity to to oh one gets tired he said ideals make lonely dwelling places let me take you somewhere and give you some tea ah to go to some shops i'm up west to work work spending money earning it i'm doing fashion articles you do you mean it well come and have some tea first it was very early and there were vacant tables in the alcoves as he sat opposite her or lavar thought what a fraud it was that the things one craved for only came to pass when one had grown resigned to doing without them how he had besought god for some such chance as this what a spectacle he had made of himself about her during six unforgettable months and now he was sipping his tea without emotion and observing that her clothes compared unfavorably with the other women's in the room in that moment orlevar saw the humiliating truth knew that he had lived his great love down and deceived himself for years but he didn't want to see he preferred to deceive himself now it is often more congenial to be an ass than to acknowledge that you have been one it's a long time since we have had tea together lucy yes she said well what have you to tell me i think i told you everything in a breath at least what have you been doing all the time trying to kill it you're working in london now eh yes i have chambers in the temple rather swagger compared with the little shanty in the rue ravignon how did you come to take up journalism someone suggested it and my twaddle seemed to do it's pretty sickening what's the idea it doesn't pay very well does it not on my paper i get a guinea a week but ah uh, why should i bore you with all that you don't bore me lucy well i i prefer to do it you don't know everything his people have never forgiven his marriage they think marriage has handicapped him so badly and you may be sure they blame me more than him it's always the daughter-in-law's fault we've only their allowance to live on it isn't pleasant to be kept by people who resent your existence poor little woman no i didn't know oh it's not so bad as all that still i'm glad to be making something even if it's only a guinea a week i don't feel so uncomfortable when i meet them not such a dead weight we have to go there to dinner on sundays and it's rather awful they tell me what a splendid career he would have if he hadn't married damn em, said orlebar i too every sunday afternoon from the soup to the coffee well she leant her elbows on the table and smiled have i changed much no he said bravely but this is brutal hard lines i didn't dream that you had things like that to put up with you always seemed so light-hearted in paris i didn't meet his people in paris besides things alter in five years i think Ugh, she broke off it's ridiculous to talk about it to you i don't know why i'm doing it have you anyone else to talk to no she admitted slowly that's it 
i can't talk to him because well they're his own people for one thing and besides well of course marriage has handicapped him and i suppose he knows it as well as they do do you mean you don't get on now she gave a shrug and traced lines in the cloth with her spoon what do you suppose i mean i am so sorry for you dear oh i dare say it's my fault i suppose i don't do all i ought to do to make up for what i've cost him it's difficult to do all you ought when when her voice snapped when you sometimes wish to god that you hadn't done so much perhaps you'd have done better to come to me after all said orlebar heavily he couldn't think of anything else to say i tried to be a good woman i thought you'd forget me i wanted to forget you why didn't you let me forget you why did you send me those flowers every year were you vexed with me for sending them no i'm glad i sent some to paris the other day did you i wondered if you would i've been rather impatient for my birthdays what a confession a woman impatient for her birthdays i never meant to see you any more though i swore i wouldn't but you wanted to didn't you her cup was neglected now she leant back in her chair her hands clasped in her lap didn't you he repeated oh don't she said in her throat i can't bear it phil what the life everything i'm tired of it all chuck it he muttered come away with me tomorrow she didn't speak she tried to believe that she was struggling the pause seemed to orlebar to last a long time while he sat wishing that he hadn't said it the waitress inquired if they required anything else and put the check on the table and took her tip the place was filling and a ladies orchestra began to twang their mandolins do you want me she asked raising her eyes do i want you what else could he reply very well then she nodded i'll go let's get out of this do you mind my head aches he knew dismally that her consent had come too late that there would be nothing now to compensate him for the scandal no months or weeks or even minutes of rapture they got up and he put the half crown on the desk and followed her into the street after they had strolled a few yards in silence he said as it seemed obligatory you've made me very happy she answered i'll try to he wished that she had said anything else it was painful we'd better have a cab where shall we go will you come to the temple i think i'd like to go home you can drive there with me can you get away in the morning or shall i put it off he asked in the hansom no i can get away he won't be back till the evening back from where he went down to his people today they're at brighton now what time's the train ten o'clock from charing cross i was going by folkestone and boulogne are you a bad sailor no i like it we'll meet at charing cross then yes in the first-class waiting room if you're sure it's not too early for you it's all right is it real phil half an hour ago we hadn't seen each other and now it's to be all our lives ah oh, i hope you'll never be sorry i wonder that's unjust is it her eyes reminded him that he ought to kiss her and he bent his head he pitied her acutely as he felt her tears on his face hated himself for lying to her cheer up dearest remember how we care for each other he said the effort of affecting joy wore him out as they drove on intensely he wished that they had found a quicker cab he wanted a drink badly wanted to light a pipe and give way to his gloom her hand which he clasped seemed to him to grow larger and heavier through the long drive and when at last they parted at her door he thanked heaven for the right to heave a sigh for the freedom to look as moody as he felt 
five years ago. If it had only happened five, four years ago, the pathos of the situation took him by the throat. What a rotten thing life was! Again his mind reverted to the months where he had been torn with longing for her, the longing just to watch her, to listen to her, no matter what she said. And now he had kissed her for the first time, as a duty. That abandonment of despair had played havoc with him, yet he wished that it had lasted. It would have been worth while, he thought. God! the ecstasy that would have been thrilling in him now if he had suffered like that until this afternoon at the club he ordered a big whiskey and a small soda you're off to rome soon aren't you said a man presently you pampered novelists have all the luck yes said orlebar the man was the editor of a daily paper it occurred to the novelist that he was about to provide the paper with some surprising copy also that the editorial greeting would be less informal when they met again what a deuce of a lot of talk there would be the damage it was going to do to him socially socially it would injure him financially too he recognized it for the first time as he surveyed the room there was mckinnell of the mayfair ragging a waiter because the toast was cold orlebar's new novel was to run through the mayfair before it came out in book form if he knew anything of mckinnell that highly respectable gentleman would refuse to pollute the pages of his journal with the fiction of a correspondent and mckinnell's refusal wouldn't be singular though he might express it with singular offensiveness even among good fellows it would be sorry but we daren't run you just now in a paper for household reading we should get no end of protests awful rot of course but there it is five hundred pounds gone five hundred pounds was a large sum he was no millionaire and his books the sale of his next books would drop in this virtuous country when he had outraged the eleventh commandment if she had been lady somebody the public would have called the case romantic it would have been a big advertisement then but without the glamour of a title they would only call it disgraceful for one reader gained by the scandal, half a dozen would be lost. What a calamity is turning into Bond Street this afternoon. And how she had jumped at him, he thought with sudden resentment. She hadn't needed much persuasion. He had been an idiot to exalt her into a heroine at the beginning. Since it had been fated that he was to ruin himself, he might at any rate have done it while he was in love with her and he hadn't even the excuse of youth now he was making a mess of his life when he was old enough to know better when he did know better he was ruining himself against his will he had another whiskey and soda and wondered if there was any chance of his hearing that she had changed her mind confound it she didn't know his address and anyhow there would be no chance what was she giving up a husband who didn't want her if she had had a child it would have been a different thing a pity she hadn't a family a husband who didn't want her and he philip orlebar was going to take her off his hands oh what a mug's game if he hadn't gone in to have his hat ironed he wouldn't have met her and it hadn't really needed ironing either he did not remain long in the club when dinner was over after all, he had mentioned that his rooms were in the temple, and the hope that she might try to communicate with him lingered in spite of common sense. At the gate he looked toward the porter eagerly, but the porter said nothing, and the shock of disappointment told Orlebar how strong the hope had been. His portmanteau were half-packed, and he spent the evening straining to catch the sound of the bell. Once it rang but the visitor was only a bore who had dropped in for a drink and a chat. Orlebar loathed the beaming face as he gave him welcome, and like the editor, the bore made envious reference to the morrow's journey. He wished he were in the author's shoes. Orlebar was at infinite pains to affect high spirits, for it was undesirable that the man should say afterwards 
I was with him the night before he bolted with her. The poor beggar seemed to have an awful hump. But presently the man said, You seem a cup low tonight, old chap. The melancholy stroke of the temple clock had never sounded so lugubrious as in the hours that followed. When he woke in the morning, Orlebar remembered that there ought to be a half-bottle of pommery in the bathroom, and he had it in lieu of tea, with some biscuits. The wine lightened his mood a little. It no longer seemed so hopelessly impossible to conceal his regret. And when he strode into the station, it was with a very fair show of impatience. But his heart leapt as he saw that she wasn't there. He sat down and glanced alternately at the clock and the doors, praying that she wouldn't come. She entered just as he was feeling sanguine. "'My darling,' he murmured, "'here you are.' "'Am I late?' "'I was beginning to be afraid, but there's time enough. I've got the tickets. Where's your luggage?' "'They've taken it through. We'd better go, then.' Among the bustle on the platform he could say little more than, "'How pale you are!' and which are your trunks then they were alone and the door had been slammed and the train moved out darling he said again well well it seems too good to be true his tone was lifeless does it doesn't it to you i think it's true she said with a tired smile how pale you are he repeated didn't you sleep not much. I've been wondering. Wondering? What? Whether I ought to have said no. What would you have done if I'd said no, Phil? Really? What can a man do? I suppose I should have had to put up with it. She did not reply for a moment. She was gazing straight before her with a frown. Do you think me a bad woman, Phil? I think you're the best woman I've ever known. It looks like it, doesn't it? The force of circumstances. If you had met me before you met him. But I didn't. It's pretty mean of me to spoil his life, isn't it? I didn't know that he cared so much about you. Oh, she hesitated. We've quarreled, like everybody else, but he's very fond of me. Of course, it'll be an awful blow. I can't forget it. I've been thinking of it ever since. Well, it just depends. The thing you've got to consider is which way you'll be happier yourself. If, I don't know, I suppose there are women who can't go wrong and be happy. I'm thinking of my duty, she faltered. You know I love you, don't you? I want you to know it, to keep remembering it all the time. I love you. I love you. I love you. But she waited with her heart in her throat but what he asked moodily what were you going to say her eyes closed with pain eh he said there are his people she stammered they'll feel the disgrace so much i've been considering everything i i didn't know what a wrench it would be you'll get over it i'm not sure perhaps i shall always do you think I've made a mistake? Again, she waited breathlessly. If he would only seize her in his arms, if he would only cry, let them all go to the devil and remember me. If you feel like that, he said feebly, of course, I hardly, I hardly know what I can say to you. You can't think of anything to say, she pleaded. There's nothing, nothing I'm overlooking. There's time. One gets over anything in time, he said incautiously. Oh, my God, she moaned. She turned to the window, her face as white as a dead woman's. The terror was confirmed that had stolen on her in the cab, that had haunted her throughout the night, confirmed by his tones, his looks, by every answer he had made to her halting falsehoods. He had learned to do without her. She had given herself unsought. In the agony of shame that overwhelmed her, she could have thrown herself from the compartment, and it was only her love for him that restrained her. She would not reproach him by deed or word. 
he shouldn't be burdened by the knowledge of what he had made her suffer well he said it's not too late no she muttered i can't go his pulses jumped for an instant he couldn't trust his voice you must do as you like i don't want to take you against your will if you wish it you can go back from folkestone i suppose if he's away there'd be no harm done would there you're not angry with me you won't mind too much don't worry about me i want you to be happy to tell you the truth i think you're right you are not the woman to kick over the traces you'd be too cut up about it go back and make the best of a bad business it'll be easier for you to bear than the other anyhow we'll see about a train for you as soon as we get in at folkestone harbor they ascertained that there would be an express to charing cross at two o'clock and he paced the platform with her till it was time to say good-bye exhilaration had given him an appetite but she answered that she wasn't hungry so as he had missed his boat he decided to drive to a hotel on the lees and have an elaborate luncheon when she had gone his glances at the playbills on the walls showed him that san toy was at the pleasure gardens and he foresaw himself cheerfully among the audience in the evening he was feeling on a sudden twenty years younger and in hard as he strove to acquire a manner of tender gravity she discerned the improvement in his spirits every time he spoke her train arrived in town a few minutes to four and she re-entered the lodging-house some hours earlier than her husband but the fire had gone out and she had to wait shivering till it was lighted before she could burn the note that she had left on the mantelpiece for him a little box addressed to her had been delivered during her absence when the slatternly servant left her alone at last the woman dared to touch it and fell to sobbing as if her heart would burst it contained the violets that orlebar had sent in token of his love the box had been redirected from paris owing to the delay the violets now that they reached her were quite dead End of section 14. Recording by Eva Davis. Section 15 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick The Favorite Plot with Variations The financier was cracking walnuts when the curate arrived. Hello, boy, he said. Why don't you come to dinner? How do you do, Uncle Murray? Oh, it was impossible to come in time for dinner. I had a meeting at six o'clock, and it's a long way from Plaistow to Park Lane. Are you quite well? Pretty fit said murray pibus glad to see you again i was going to drop you a line i go to new york next month help yourself to port thank you i don't drink wine said cuthbert a shade reproachfully i forgot said pibus cigar but you don't smoke either well take an armchair make yourself comfortable how's plaster the curate cleared his throat i was anxious to have a talk with you uncle murray on a very important subject so you wrote me well i know your important subjects you needn't go into details of course it's a bona fide case how much do you want frankly i'm nervous faltered his nephew better try the port counsel pibus no all right stick to your colors even if they are a blue ribbon you've always been so generous more than generous your subscriptions and and your proposals as regards myself though i couldn't accept them where natural enough you'll have to have the lot one day i've nobody else to leave it to and i'm not the man to marry again he laughed it'll be a funny position eh? Huh? an east end curate blooming into a millionaire you're a queer fish cuthbert i don't say any more about your not coming into the city you weren't cut out for it but what do you want to starve in the slums for if the church was the only thing to suit you you might as well have had a snug berth in it i thought at least i hoped said cuthbert stiffly 
that I'd made my principles clear to you long ago. I have no desire for a snug berth. I told you so when the call came to me. My object in taking orders was never to attain material comforts. If I had sought worldly advantages, I should have embraced a commercial career instead. I choose to labor among those who need my poor help the most, and I choose to be in truth their brother, not to hold myself aloof from them, a preceptor in a pleasance. Oh, very proper, very high-minded, said the financier hurriedly. A reputation for conscientiousness, of course, is a valuable asset. Have it your own way, my lad. If I am not to do anything for you in my lifetime, we'll say no more about it. The curate flushed. As a matter of fact, he stammered, my reason for wishing to see you was to beg you to do something for me. My principles are quite unchanged. I still mean to work among the poor. I am still resolved to abstain from living among them luxuriously. But, uh, well, circumstances have arisen which, uh, perhaps, I had better tell you everything as it happened. Best way, said Pybus, repressing a groan. I was rather seriously unwell some weeks ago, and my vicar induced me to take a brief holiday. He's always most considerate. Any family at the vicarage? Family? There are his three daughters. Ah, murmured the millionaire. Yes, he would consider you attentively. Go on. Some pleasant seaside place was desirable, and I went to Hastings. The castle is most fascinating. Well? Well, my lodgings were not cheerful, and the weather was unpropitious, so altogether... You got the hump? I was, er, uh, rather, yes. One evening, as it was too wet to take a walk, I attended a performance of A Crown of Thorns. Of course, I had heard about it. I knew that it had been approved by organs of the press that don't mention such things as a rule, but I confess that it amazed me. I found its religious teaching quite as admirable as the historical instruction it afforded, the insight into the life of ancient Rome. It was practically my first visit to a theatre, and a most memorable experience. Perhaps you know the play? Girl holds up a cross in the limelight, and the lions are afraid to eat her? No, sir, there are no lions. There are lions in the pictorial advertisements of the play, but they are not actually visible on the stage. It isn't too much to say that I was overwhelmed. I was ashamed of the unreasoning prejudice I had always entertained against theatrical performances. You haven't come to ask me to endure a theatre, I hope, put in the millionaire genially. Oh, indeed, not at all, sir. The idea had not presented itself to me. Hear me out. The part of the heroine was taken by a lady who possessed such spiritual fervour that, at first, I regretted her choice of a career. How true it is that prejudice dies hard. I grieved. It was narrow of me that she was not devoting herself to the propagation of faith among the heathen of her own time instead of to the mimic. Uh, I mean, that it seemed to me she was wasting her precious gifts, that she ought to have been a missionary. I quite follow you, said Pybus dryly. I did not recognize the truth at once, but then it came to me. I understood. As I looked round at the eyes wet with tears, I saw that the stage may make for good as powerfully as the pulpit. I saw that this beautiful girl, uttering the grace that was in her to hundreds nightly, I don't know if I mentioned that she has been favoured with remarkable beauty, was stirring the minds of mere pleasure-seekers to the contemplation of higher things. I saw that she was working in the same cause as myself. "'Great Scott, boy! You've fallen in love with an actress?' exclaimed Pybus. "'So that's it?' "'Later I certainly learned to love her,' replied the curate, with dignity though I don't perceive by what process you have arrived at the fact. I had the happiness to meet her the next afternoon in the waiting-room at a dentist's, and the passing of a magazine led to conversation. Did you tell her that you thought she ought to have been a missionary? I believe I did say something of my earlier regret, and she agreed with me that she was doing equally exalted work on the stage. Perhaps my enlightenment may be partly due to that conversation. Her thoughts on the subject were very beautiful. One answer that she made impressed me deeply. Religion and art, she said, are in reality the same thing. Without the context, it is not so forcible, but when she said it, it was a perfect expression of what we meant. It was most illuminative. 
"'How much have you been muddling yourself up with this girl?' asked the financier curtly. "'Sir? I say, how far has it gone? What happened after she illuminated the dentists?' "'We met often after the dentists, on the parade. We used to listen to the town crier together. She found a town crier so quaint. Anything that savours of a bygone age appeals to her strongly.' Fortunately, too, the company was going to London, to various theatres in the suburbs, so I was able to see her when I returned, and, uh, and she has consented to be my wife. You told her you were my nephew, uh, my heir? I saw no reason for reticence. I trust you have not formed a poor opinion of a lady whom you have never seen? Not at all. I should have a poor opinion of her if she had refused you under the circumstances. But you are making yourself ridiculous. You have lost your head over an actress. You have taken a queer clerical way about it. But you have lost your head over an actress. It won't do, Cuthbert. The thing's absurd. Cuthbert had turned very pale. I'm sorry to find you so unjust, he groaned. I had hoped, in view of the many offers you have so kindly made me, that you'd be willing to, to further my happiness. Marriage upon my stipend is impossible, as you know. I trusted your affection to... to... Why, you've pressed me to take an allowance over and over again. Look here, boy, exclaimed Pybus. I'm going to talk straight to you. You're the nearest relative I've got, and though you were never the sort I was keen on leaving a million to, I knew you'd waste it in a creditable and conscientious kind of way. Also, I'm only fifty, and I hoped you'd have got more sense by the time I died. But this alters matters. I shouldn't leave my money to you if you made a ridiculous marriage and I don't part with a quit to help you to do it. That's plain English. You can tell her what I've said when you keep the appointment at the stage door tonight. She can marry you if she likes, but she'll live in Plasto on what you've got now. There'll be nothing from me. And you, observed Cuthbert bitterly, are called a man of the world. Why, sir, you are displaying all the narrowness of the least sophisticated. She's an actress, and so to wed her must be misfortune. She's an actress. And you are a fool, said Pybus. But I don't want to quarrel with you. I've been there myself. Thirty years ago, we have all been there some time. You go to a theatre, you see a pretty woman, and you think you are in love. You are a curate, so your symptoms are a bit complicated. But the complaint is very usual, Cuthbert. Believe me, it won't be fatal. Will you allow me to introduce her to you? pleaded Cuthbert. Will you give me a chance to overcome your prejudices? No, I won't. I haven't any prejudices. I dare say the girl's right enough for the right man, but she's a long way from right for you. You don't really suppose she can care about you. You're a good lad, but the last fellow in the world to please an actress. If you hadn't told her you were my nephew, she would have laughed in your face when you proposed to her. I'm prepared, said the curate resignedly, to suffer humiliation if need be. Oh, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but, er, uh, well, she would. I know what actresses are like. But you don't know her. If you would talk to her once, she would convert you. You would own you were wrong. My life's happiness is at stake. Before you decide, let me bring her to see you. Surely it is no more than fair. Pybus picked up the evening papers. It's no good going on with it. That's all I've got to say. He opened the Pall Mall. Good night, sir, quavered the curate, extending a hopeless hand. Good night, boy, said the financier cordially. Whenever you want anything in reason, let me know. Cuthbert took a bus to Victoria and arrived at the Shakespeare Clapham in ample time. It was still embarrassing to him to loiter at a stage door, but a man is justified in meeting his fiancée anywhere. He endeavoured to assert this by his bearing when loafers stared at him. Nobody was ever quite so high-minded as Cuthbert tried to look when he waited at stage doors. My own, I failed, he told her as they walked to Clapham Junction. The hand on his arm trembled. What did he say? He was obdurate. He refused point blank. Why should I pain you by repeating the insults I had to bear? Just because I'm an actress? exclaimed the girl pathetically. Oh, what we have to put up with, we artists. How uncharitable they are to us. Then it's all over between you and I? He winced but tears were swimming in her lovely eyes. It would have been heartless to mention grammar. "'I cannot lose you,' he cried. "'I cannot. We might. No, it's out of the question. What's to be done? 
Angela, I almost lose faith. Hush, she murmured, looking upward. It may be all for the best, dear. It must be, though it is hard for us to understand it. Do you think he would relent when we were married? I fear not. He would never know you. If he had let me take you to him, we should succeed, I'm sure. Your intelligence and beauty would win him over, though he wouldn't appreciate your soul. But he declined to see you. It's a pity I can't be introduced to him as somebody else. Go there as a hospital nurse or something? Then, when I'd got round him, and he was very grateful to me, I could say, My name is Angela Noble. I love your nephew. It is a sweet idea, but his health is robust, and besides, he goes abroad very soon. That's what I shall have to do, she said moodily. You? If we don't marry, I must take the engagement for New York. You know, I have the offer open. I shall have to go. New York? cried Cuthbert. I hoped you had dismissed the notion. He was meditative. Angela, I have a daring thought. I will not fail. Pybus was considerably surprised a day or two later at receiving a pleasant letter from the young man wishing him an agreeable voyage and inquiring by what boat he was to cross. He was considerably irritated at receiving a second letter reminding him of his permission to ask reasonable favours. A lady of the curate's acquaintance was departing for America unprotected by that very vessel, an act of courtesy that Mr. Pybus would kindly show to the friendless lady his affectionate nephew would much appreciate. It was added tactfully that, her means precluding speculation, no fear need be entertained of her angling for tips. Piper swore and dictated a gracious note, and the boat sailed. Miss Noble unpacked her cabin trunk with the painful consciousness that steamers travel fast. When she had made the chance remark that inspired her lover, she had been thinking vaguely of his sick room and plenty of time for womanly gentleness to be admired. Between Acts 2 and 3, a month lapses. An Atlantic racer was alarmingly different. And the uncle was more discouraging still. Every uncle that she had ever known refusing his consent had a white moustache and side whiskers, and was slightly bowed with age and cynicism. Here was a hale and hearty uncle, carelessly good-humoured. Such a person seemed less likely to break up into slushy sentiment than the iciest cynic that ever sneered. The report that reached Plasto from Queenstown was not a sanguine one. There's just this in our favour, she had scribbled. He has no suspicion who I am, and he can't escape me without jumping overboard. You may bet. Bet had been imperfectly erased. Feel sure I shall do as much in the time as I can. Dear one, Cuthbert kissed the ship stationery with enthusiasm. She was a bright girl. She hasn't been seen to advantage with the curate and she was working for by far the most profitable engagement of her career. Before the first sweepstake on the run, she began to play her part in quite another manner than the one she had mentally rehearsed. The spiritual note that Cuthbert had expected of her, to go on being the heroine of a crown of thorns after the curtain was down, wouldn't catch on here at all, she decided. There was no hit to be made on those lines. Admiration, a wide-eyed homage for the financier's cleverness, Probably all the women he met looked at him like that. It had been played out long ago. The smartest thing would be to treat the middle-aged magnate as if he were an amusing young man. She did it. It was much easier than being soulful, much less fatiguing. She laughed, she chaffed, she even flirted with him a little. Pybus, who had been prepared to find her a consummate nuisance, hadn't been on such good terms with himself for years. The day before they sighted Sandy Hook, he said, I hope I shall see something of you after we land. Are you staying in New York long? I, I hardly know, she answered. It depends. It depended on the way he took it when she sprung the truth on him directly. She felt less self-possessed than usual. Anyhow, there's my address. If there's anything I can do, I shall be glad. That's very kind of you. I wonder how much you mean it. She flashed a glance. I might ask for something big. Ah, uh, I didn't pledge myself to do anything you asked. I said I'd be glad to do anything I could. Cautious person. They were pacing the deck, and they walked in silence for a minute. She was wondering if it would be discreet to delay her confession till they had arrived. You are nervy today, said Pybus. You look as if you were going to say you had a headache. 
it's just the moment for a glass of champagne and a cracker let's go below and get them i don't think i care about it thanks but you're quite right i'm nervy i want to tell you something shall we sit down they sat down and again there was silence well he questioned i don't know how to begin let me help you suggested pybus pull me up if i'm wrong you're an actress my nephew cuthbert thinks he's in love with you and you came aboard in the hope of persuading me to agree to your marriage whether you were going to new york anyhow i don't know i trust you were for i should be sorry to have put you to so much inconvenience now the beginning is over proceed miss noble had uttered a faint exclamation of astonishment she stared blankly at the sea you seem surprised he said that is unflattering to my intelligence cuthbert's circle of pretty women is strictly limited i take it any doubt that i had of your identity when i got this letter was removed the moment i saw you oh then you do think i'm pretty faltered miss noble you're not a beauty but your face is pleasing i say you threw yourself in my way with the intention of convincing me that you were a much nicer girl than i supposed you to be am i correct quite correct said miss noble in a low voice it was an innocent plot it is the favorite one it has been in the english magazines every month since i was a child well i am convinced don't misunderstand me i find you brainier wittier and nicer in every respect in fact you are even more calculated than i assumed to spoil his life mr pybus keep your temper it's a reflection on him not on you i'll explain cuthbert is my heir for the mirror which may be translated as because i haven't a son much as i should like one and though i've never pretended he was the apple of my eye i should regret to see him come to grief if you were the flabby phonographic sort of young woman to echo his sentiments and make him happy i'd say take him with my sympathy he is yours you are a hundred percent too charming for the marriage to be a success you have come down to his standard very effectually so far i admit it must have given you a lot of trouble but you couldn't hope to impose on him always before he had discovered half your attractions they'd break his heart i i don't know what to say to you then then you refuse it's a novelty to see you at a loss yes i refuse unhesitatingly among the few certainties of life we may count the fact that you'll never marry cuthbert with any help from me for the reason that you've given me among others if i may say so for the further reason that i don't wish you to be unhappy either you find him a pill naturally and you'd have been bored to death you're despising me she exclaimed you think i am a mercenary creature without a heart who don't talk to me as if i were cuthbert i don't despise you in the least you are in a very precarious and overcrowded calling and you would have married him for position as hundreds and thousands of fashionable and wealthy girls would be willing to marry him if i smiled approval but i know you would have found him dear at the price and i have a third reason though i can assert quite truthfully that the first alone would prevent my consenting i'd like to marry you myself you she gasped why not of course you're not in love with me but you like me much better than you like him you can't dispute it professionally you're 19 i suppose that's to say you're really about 28 so i'm 2 and 20 years older than you are it's a lump but i'm lively for my age and if you go on flirting with me you'll make me feel considerably younger it'll be rough on cuthbert i own my marrying you will cost him about a million still he won't have you in any case and 150 a year would be a great deal more appropriate besides it's entirely his own fault he should have taken no for an answer when he came to see me and then i should never have met you think it over if you regard me as a fairly young man you needn't hesitate and if you don't remember that there is no fool like an old one that you will have a very good time you couldn't respect me murmured miss noble you'd feel that i was only marrying the money that the man didn't matter I'm not without some natural vanity I assure you come which do you feel more at home with him or me you admitted miss noble softly that settles it said pybus we'll get tiffany's to send round some engagement rings in the morning end of section 15 recording by sk edison new jersey